sure that these people include the things that are going to encourage families to rent. No, that's a good point. Uh, so right down the road here at Bossburg in 20 is the preserve at West Creek. So that's a, a new complex right. built over the last couple of years. So sidewalks now on Route 20 on Bossburg. We're, but there's no kid, there's no room for kids for- There's a basketball court in there. That's it. And then they have- um, <coughs> What about swing for little kids? What about sandboxes for little kids? Wouldn't you end up with families that cannot yet afford to move into a house, move into an apartment, the reason they go many times but in that interim, they're, they're left with having to drive to a park that has those amenities. Well, from what I've seen, just from driving past that facility every day, um, on Friday afternoon, going home from work, I saw a father with probably a five-year-old kid walk, riding their bike on the sidewalk. I see kids- On the main road? Um, no, on the sidewalk right here. Not on the main road, on the, there's sidewalks now on from the preserve at West Creek going yeah. up. So I see family on, members. But from, the sidewalk is on the main road is what I'm saying. The correct. The sidewalk is on, is on Route 20. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that's kind of dangerous, but that's my own opinion. No, but that's good points. I think that's something that, <coughs> so for that facility, um, they actually had to come back for a site plan amendment because they had a parking issue right. because I think they had more families than anticipated moving in there because they ended up putting quite a few three bedroom units into that apartment complex, which is potentially accommodating a family. Um, so a lot of families have two vehicles, maybe more, where you have a motorcycle and two vehicles, um, which is why they came back. But I, I don't disagree with you in terms of trying to provide more age friendly accommodations for some of these bigger developments. And there's different types of affordable housing. Right. You know, a lot of it, you can do Section 8 housing, you can do well, affordable no housing Section that's- eight house. Section 8 housing no longer exists. No, it's everywhere. No, it's not, it's not labeled <laughs> Section 8 housing yet. It's everywhere. It's everywhere in this Every town. Apartment. Every apartment is eligible for that. The owner of the apartment complex has to be willing to deal with Section 8 and it's a regulated <coughs> process. Well, I know a lot about Section 8. Okay. The housing is not affordable to many people in this town. Both I agree with that. <laughs> and in terms of apartments, and I think that there needs to be, um, there, there are incentives out there for builders and developers to come in and do that. I think that's something we need to start looking at when it comes to country hamlets and PUDs. So yeah. those are not use by right, those are legislative approvals. Right. I think we should start looking at that. Maybe there's a lot of communities, particularly down in the southern part of the state, Westchester County, for instance, um, anything you build, they're looking for maybe a 10% minimum affordable housing as a percentage of that. Um, now on this, I'll, I'll get to you in one second. So Robin Gray brings up a good point with affordability. That's something I, one of my opening statements. Let me give you kind of an anecdote of what we're dealing with here. So where we are now is in the, the Fort Hunter district uh, of Gilderland. So we have the Fort Hunter Fire District up on Carmen Road. For it's All of our fire departments here are volunteer. And there's state regulations that for volunteer fire departments, <coughs> you can only have a certain percentage of your firefighters that can live outside of the district. That's primarily related to response rates. So if you have a call, somebody can get to the station really quick. There are multiple people within the Fort Hunter Fire District, volunteer firefighters, that have to move out of the district because they can't afford to live in this part of town. It's so bad that the fire district had to get approval to increase their percentage from 20% to 40% of their firefighters living outside of the district. So they're going into Rotterdam or they're 
going to other parts of the town where they can find more reasonable rents, that's an issue. Right. If, if we can't provide housing for a firefighter or for policemen or EMS to live in your town and be close to where you're working for those types of jobs, it's important to live close to where you work, we need to address that as a community. Um, so I think that's just one example. Uh, there's a lot of people in town that work for the town that live in apartments. Um, rents going from 900 to 1200 is not uncommon. Uh, if you're living by yourself and you're making 50,000 a year, that's hard. When you're just $300 a month for your rent, we all know what's happening, gas prices and food prices. It's causing people to move elsewhere. So unless we can come up with a way to provide affordable options, now whether that's in a single family home, a town home, a condo, an apartment, as a community, we need to consider all those options because housing affordability is our number one issue here in trying to attract people. Because when I look at a father and a son riding their bike or a young couple walking their dog, those are future homeowners. If you can't capture the 25 to 35 age group to at least get into your community and live in an apartment or a townhome just to get your feet into that town, into that school district, that renter is a future homeowner. I'm guilty of that. When I lived in Las Vegas, I first I lived in an apartment, then I bought a house. When my wife and I moved back to Albany, we rented an apartment for two years and then bought a house. You have to capture the younger age group because if you don't capture that, they're gonna go to the city of Albany, they're gonna go to Colony, they're gonna go to Bethlehem, and they're, we're gonna lose that demographic that is your future homeowner. So these are all things that we need to talk about when it comes to the comprehensive plan. Uh, so Robin, that is, that is a good, uh, affordability is very important. Sometimes there's some fire departments that get calls and there's nobody available to respond to that. So they have to go to another district now to respond. So if Gilliland Center gets a call and there's nobody there or available, they have to go up. I mean, this is... Yeah, it's a problem. Actually, I think I'll come to you, Diane, and then... Nice to meet you, Sherry. people to do is uh, do we have a lot of people in here that have signed up for the e-subscribe so when an agenda is posted you get the email if you on our town website on the home page on the left hand side uh, I think it says e-subscribe or news service if you click on that it'll pull up all of the boards and committees in town so you can pick and choose you know, planning board town board zoning board uh, conservation advisory council land use advisory <coughs> committee you can click on each one. So when we post an agenda for, for a particular meeting, you'll get an email notification that the agenda has been posted. So then you can then go on and look to see what is on that particular agenda. I think for the planning board, I think that goes out to either 6,000 or 8,000 different emails. Uh, that's the best way to, okay. <laughs> But I would recommend, so when I have people come to the counter or call me with that same question, that's what I always recommend, is 
getting a notification that a particular board that you're interested in that their agenda has been posted. some of the agendas we post uh, <coughs> might be 200 pages of documents on um, three or four different projects. We're, as a town, we're trying to be as transparent as possible with posting all the information we can on a project. The downside of that is it's almost like information overload. When you get too much information, you don't look at anything. Um, one of the things at the zoning board and planning board level we've tried to do over the last month or so is typically so zoning board and planning board meetings are on Wednesdays. Historically, what we've been doing is on a Friday afternoon is when we post the agenda. What we've been doing recently is posting those agendas on Wednesdays now. Try to give a couple more days. Um, even though the agenda still might be in draft form or not <coughs> fully complete, we're at least getting the project names up there with some of the data. And then by Friday, it'll be finalized. But I think the initial feedback, it's, it's been helpful to have that extra couple of days to review. Um, because it's not only the public that is reviewing that, but it's our board members too. Um, so, you know, they have full-time jobs, a lot of them, and they're trying to digest and absorb all of that information as well. Um, so I think between doing the e-subscribe and then getting our agendas posted a couple days earlier is, that's a step we're trying to take to be even more transparent. I think that kind of follows up to with what Robin was saying is I think a lot of times I think we're just happy to get the dedication of the green space and then we worry about what's going to happen on that in the future um, and then it goes to resources too is we have the parkland reservation fund if anybody's familiar with that So I think well, you. Actually, I think Diane has. I'll go to in the back and then you next. Okay, you want me to talk now? Yeah. Okay, I want to just comment on two things. Um, number one, when you talk about the Pope Park there, you got to just call them. I live in Weatherfield, and I've been there for 40 years. I was the first president of the homeowners association out there. We have a common area that the owners of the houses, and I want to get back to affordability because there's this thinking, I think, in Gilderland that Weatherfield is some kind of exclusive place. Houses go from 170,000 to 750. The house next door to me sold last year without even going to a realtor for $280,000. That's very affordable. That's, that's not escalating in my view. But anyway, back to the forever wild. You have deer being displaced, you have fox, all the animals. If you keep putting in parks and you keep bringing
coming in asphalt, we worry about our safety at night with kids congregating, teenagers, and so on. That's a legitimate issue. We want our, our green space forever wild. We don't want parks everywhere because they have to be supervised. No, that's a good question. I think that kind of follows up on what uh, Robin was saying is not every space, so here's the 33 acres, this is not gonna get developed into something like Tower Center Park. Right. You're gonna have walking trails through there and that's it. So in terms of trying to keep a unfragmented you know, animal corridor, I think you know, this is what you'll see. Is I don't think it'll, it'll be like the Bosberg trails. Um, you know, it's walking trails, you can walk out to the <coughs> reservoir it's just walking trails. There's you know, no playground sets. Um, so I think in terms of you know, impacts to the wildlife, when you have low, what we consider passive recreation in areas like that, um, I think that speaks to your, your comments. Uh, yes, sir, I think you were next. Um, yeah, so an observation. I mean, everybody here's bringing up a, real, a lot of really great comments and, and, and concerns about the infrastructure of the community. Um, uh, So there's a, a lot in what you just said. So let me try to get some of that. So this right here, these two lots, is, is this development. So I mentioned earlier about the water line and sewer line extension going up Fuller Station, uh, I think up to Williamsburg. So what's gonna happen to that lot now that you have water and sewer there? As soon as you bring water and sewer past a property that's 100 acres, 50 acres, what do you think is going to happen to that? That's, it'll be developed at some point. Um, same with these lots in here. Now there's a lot of wetlands over in here. But in terms of leapfrogging, when you extend water and sewer, that's when you get the leapfrogging. If you're out in the RA3 district, it's a three acre minimum lot side, there's no infrastructure there. It's going to be hard to develop at densities like this. In the RA3 district, you can do a cluster subdivision down to a 20,000 acre or 20,000 square foot minimum lot size, which is roughly a half an acre. You need water and sewer to be able to do that. So once you extend water and sewer, you're gonna see that leapfrogging. So in terms of connectivity, we're really looking at, when you look at an aerial view, particularly over, um, grid pattern or curvilinear streets, but what's connecting one neighborhood to the other? You've got no connections, no open space, no trails, no sidewalks. <clears throat> With a cluster subdivision, instead of, you know, their typical way of connecting neighborhoods maybe by sidewalks or just that typical grid pattern that you see is now being transformed into, again, if, if this, 
property develops at some point in the future and you do another cluster subdivision, maybe you have a big area of green space here where now you're connecting different neighborhoods via trails and